All right, Ellen, are you are you ready? Uh, ready as I'll ever be. Yeah, okay, <laughs> well, take it away. Thank you so much for the introduction, Tim. Um, and thank you guys for having me. So uh, I think it's been almost a year since I, I visited you guys in person, and it was just really nice to get to to meet a lot of your club members. And so I'm really honored to be back. Thank you for having me. Um, I see lots of familiar names and faces on the Zoom and some new ones too. So um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Ellen Bell and I own a small uh, business called Bell Farm. We're located in Runnels, Iowa. We're about 12 miles Southeast of Des Moines. Uh, our primary line of business is beekeeping, and I'm headed into my eighth season of keeping bees this year. We've taken a little bit different road with beekeeping than, than a lot of other keepers. So um, rather than focusing on honey production, we have kind of evolved to focus primarily on queen rearing. So I'm looking forward to talking to you guys tonight and just telling you a little bit more about uh, the journey of my business. So I am also fairly new to Zoom since I'm a, I'm a full-time beekeeper. I, I don't use Zoom for my profession. So uh, bear with me here just a little bit as I kind of figure out how to share my screen. Let's see. And I will get going here. Let's see. All right, can everybody, can you guys see that okay? Yes, okay, good, I see some nods, awesome. All right, well, like I said, we're going into our, into our eighth year of keeping bees. So we got started back in the spring of 2014. And we started, I think, um, very much the way that I'm sure a lot of you guys started keeping bees. So we, we started by taking a class and we purchased two hives and two packages to fill them. And of course, you know, the, the bees grew, the hives did well that year. And I feel a little bit like that first year of beekeeping, I mean, for, for me at least, but I think for, for me and maybe a lot of other people, um, I liken it a little bit to being blindfolded and on a roller coaster uh, in the sense that, you know it's going to be an exciting ride, but you're, you're just not really sure what exactly is going to happen. You're, you're so new to it. Um, so this was a really fun presentation to put together because I got to go through a lot of my historical pictures and look back on, you know, things that we've done. And so I look at this photo and I see it through a different set of eyes now than, you know, what we did when we took it. At the time, I know it was really hot that day. And so we were kind of marveling about the fact that the bees were bearding on the front of the hives. And I look back on it now and say, well, gosh, that's probably some swarm buildup going on there on the, the hive on the left. But um, at the time, I'm just not sure that uh, we had a good enough grasp of what was handling, you know, what was happening to really have a handle on that. So thankfully in, in my beginning beekeeping class, um, taking care of mites was definitely something that we focused on. So we did, we did well, we got the hives, you know, through that, through that first winter. And this was kind of a view of our little apiary the next year in 2015. So we're slowly growing. Um, and I, I chuckle as I look at this picture because you might look at this and think, well, okay, you know, she like made some splits, she's growing a little bit. Full disclosure, we did actually did not make any splits um, because I, I just didn't, I didn't realize that that was something that I needed to do at that time. So um, of course, what happened was uh, the hives swarmed and we had that, you know, crazy second year fiasco of, of trying to catch swarms and thankfully we did catch them and made some splits, but um, of course sacrificed honey production. So we were, we were our second year in beekeeping still having never had any of our own honey. So by, by our second year, I think I was maybe at the point where like I knew just enough to be dangerous. <laughs> so I, I had a, a better feel and handle for what I was doing, enough so that I thought like, okay, this is something I enjoy. This is something that I want to do more of and we want to grow. Um, 
so we found there was another small beekeeper kind of in our in our same general geographic area that was sort of getting out of the business and so we bought um a large portion of his operation out and he had like 12 hives and you know a lot of equipment so for us that was a really big expansion um in a really short amount of time we went from having like five hives to 20 you know almost overnight so this is us coming home with with some of those hives and then like figuring out oh my gosh what do we what do we do now and that was actually the first point at which we felt like we had enough hives that it actually made sense to start to spread them out and put them in some different locations so we expanded then had a couple different yards and and that was something new and different for us as well all this time like the first few years of keeping bees i i still kind of think i was i sort of felt like i was muddling around in the dark in a sense like um i didn't have a mentor yet at that point and that is something that i super encourage for um, new beekeepers don't don't be like me get find a mentor um, early on in the process because it's definitely an invaluable resource um, but you know with with such quick expansion going from like five to 20 hives we had all these questions and no idea you know who to ask or what to do and so we found ourselves um, on a lot of like the Facebook beekeeping groups and asking questions about you know how do I make a split and is this queen performing well what what do I do if I think I have a failing queen so on and so forth and so um, around that time um, this this funny looking guy started sending me uh, messages on Facebook and reaching out to me in fact I think this was probably his Facebook profile picture at the time and I mean I didn't had no idea like who this was or what this what this picture meant but um this is my mentor Dan Dixon from Norwalk and he just sort of took me under his wing and started answering a lot of these um common you know second third year beekeeper kinds of questions that I had and since we had grown a lot and and you know we had a couple dozen hives at that point he kind of started poking me about queen rearing so as I was having queen problems or needing to make splits he was asking me questions like, well, why aren't you raising your own queens? Like, why are, you know, why are you spending 30, 40 bucks to go and, you know, buy queens from somebody else? And I thought, well, you know, this sounds fascinating. I was intrigued. So we kind of started this conversation um, about queen rearing uh, against my better judgment at that point. I already totally had my hands full with everything else, but I kind of let him talk me into to trying my hand at queen rearing. So around that time um we he he explained to me that the first step i needed to take was to put together um this really big colony called a cell builder so in order to um graft queens to raise queen cells you have to have this great big colony that in essence builds the cells so that's why it's called a cell builder well what he maybe didn't tell me like he explained to me how to put it all together and and so then you know we're going out for like a week or two we're we're checking on this colony um because you're sort of building it's almost like you're creating a monster in essence like you have this enormous colony you have colony. you're you have packing it full 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 of bees oh hang on just a second guys i'm sorry i've got some feedback here let's see is that better and everybody hear me okay all right i don't know what happened there all right so at any rate um we had this this cell builder that we had put together and um, we're checking on it for a week or two leading up to our first graft and i gotta tell you it's it's not for the faint of heart like i think at this point this was probably the most bees that i had ever seen in any one place at one time so I, it was very daunting, you know, going going into this process. And um, because you have such an incredibly full colony, as you know, all of you beekeepers understand, in essence, what you're doing is creating a hive that really wants to swarm, right? So you got all these bees and all they want to do is draw out queen cells and swarm. So it's it's very much a challenge to keep them big, but keep them all in the hive. So we made it through that week or two of like tending this crazy colony and, and got up to the point where we were going to actually attempt our first graft. And this is kind of the, the part of the process I, that people really think about when we talk about queen rearing is like the actual, the actual grafting part. 
And so for those who are not real familiar with this, um, what we're doing here, we have a frame of very young larva and we're using a small metal grafting tool to basically scoop those really tiny larva up. And then we are depositing them into these um, special little queen cups that you can see here in this picture. And so it's like, it's really a tedious process, you know, like, excuse me, you can see that I have a headlamp on as we're doing this um, for good lighting. You know, you have to have good eyesight to really see what you're doing. But I've always been somebody that likes a challenge. So, <laughs> so I kind of felt like this, you know, this is exciting. This is fun. Let's, let's see if I can do this or not. So, um, and to give you kind of an idea, just like the size of the larva that we're moving. Um, and I don't know how well you guys can see this since we're on Zoom, but um, that there is the larva like circled in there on that, um, on that slide. So super, super tiny, super tiny little guys that were moving around. So we graft all these larvae, we put them back in the, this huge cell builder that we've created, and we leave them alone for like five days and come back and we had just like a little bit of success, right? We got half a dozen to a dozen queen cells. And so it was, it was so exciting, you know, but at this point it's still like almost conceptual. I mean, you know that there are queens in there that are developing um, at, you're excited, you know, you want to see, are they going to hatch? Are they going to get mated? Um, so, you know, Dan talked me through this process of um, splitting a few hives, taking a few frames of brood, a few frames of resources, and then putting in one queen cell with each of these hives and monitoring them for a week or two to see, um, do the queens emerge and do they get mated? And so, Two weeks later, we opened up those splits and, and this is what we saw. And for me, I think in that moment, like I was just hooked. <laughs> Cause I, you know, you, when you've dropped $40 on, you know, queens, um, it's really amazing to see that, you know, you can produce one of these uh, on your own and um, really exciting to that, just that first like exhilarating rush of success. So, you know, at that point, I'm like, I'm hooked. I, I, I thought this is something I can do and I wanted to, you know, practice and get better at it. And, you know, we had just enough hives that I could, I sort of felt like I could play with it. So I started putting together more cell builders. This is still my third, my third year of beekeeping that we were doing this. So I just kept grafting and grafting and grafting and we kind of kept growing and growing. I think my my husband wanted to just kill me because I kept telling him I need more equipment. So he had to go and like build me more more equipment and stuff. Um, at one point he he told me that I might need to, there's probably groups for people like me. Like I needed to join Grafters Anonymous. I needed to just stop grafting. <laughs> but it was really, it was really, really fun. So um yeah, the growth spiraled very, very quickly in that like third and fourth year for us. And of course, just like anything, we've had lots of, you know, lots of challenges and lots of lessons that we've learned along the way. Um, so this is a picture just kind of showing those grafting bars. And so each of these bars holds 15 cells. And so like this particular graft, two bars, so I would have been grafting 30 cells and you can see that they maybe drew out three or four on there, like not very many. So, I mean, initially this is what a lot of my grafts were like, really just disappointing, you know, didn't, didn't get much out of it and, and left wondering too, like, is it user error? Did I maybe damage those larvae when I was actually transferring them? Or was there actually something wrong with the cell builder? And um, so just lots of like mysteries to unravel, trial and error, if you will. And we finally kind of got to a point where, you know, we did get better at it. So I, I like to show this picture off, but I'll also be the first to tell you, I've only had this happen one time <laughs> uh, in all the time that I've been grafting. Only once did we actually have a perfect take um, on our graft. But, but we have finally gotten to the point where I, pretty consistently we get 90 to 95% um, take on our graphs. So, I mean, it's just like anything, you know, practice makes perfect for sure. So, 
So does anybody want to unmute and tell me what's going on with the bee that's circled in this picture? Deformed wing virus. Yes, thank you. So deformed wing virus um, is a very common virus of the Western honeybee and it is caused by a high mite load in your hives. And so when you open a hive and you see, you know, a, a little bee looking like this, it's a very disheartening experience because you know that um, probably that varroa threshold is way over where it should be already in that hive. And so just like lots of lots of beekeepers, we have also struggled with, um, you know, mite control, particularly um, you know, with the grafting and the making splits and expanding. So we've got all these colonies that are growing, 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 growing. Um, and, you know, Varroa operates, it reproduces in brood. So anytime that you have big colonies, they're getting bigger and they're growing, um, you've created the perfect opportunity for Varroa to get out of hand. So this, the, I know this is like kind of a complex chart. You don't have to study it a ton or anything, but um, this is kind of a, a method that was developed by Randy Oliver of Scientific Beekeeping um, quite a while ago, actually. It's not, it's like 10 years old, um, but it's called Simple Early Treatment of Nukes Against Varroa. And this was something that um, my mentor introduced me to uh, very early on. And so the principle behind the method, it's kind of twofold. So having an understanding that um, oxalic acid, which is I think very um, kind of popular, it's sort of in vogue, everybody wants to try using OA right now for, for mite control, um, but very important to understand that um, oxalic acid does not touch mites that are underneath capped brood, right? We have to have exposed mites in order for oxalic acid to be effective. Um, and then combine that with the knowledge that when we do make a split, so we're in essence taking some frames of brood away from um, an existing queen and we're, we're setting those off like in their own hive. When you put a queen cell in, you have this downtime, right? So you've got like two weeks where you're waiting for that, that virgin queen to emerge and she's got to go out and you know go on her mating flights, get mated, come back, start laying eggs. So you have this downtime where you don't really have any new brood. So this method kind of takes those two principles and combines them. Um, some people don't like requeening with queen cells or doing walkaway splits for that reason because of the, the brood break. But I say let's use it, you know, to your, to your full advantage. So making a split with a queen cell basically gives you like this two to three day window of opportunity where you have very, very little, if any, capped brood and um, is a great opportunity to jump in there and treat with um, oxalic acid and drop a lot of mites. So anyway, that, that's a method that um, we kind of adopted early and has worked quite well for us um, with our queen rearing methods for controlling Varroa. Um, the time sensitivity of queen rearing is, is another thing that um, is definitely a struggle. It's something that we've, we've kind of, we've learned the hard way. Um, so if you look at like my picture on the left here with, with all the queen cells in their, you know, in their bars and, and that frame is in your cell builder, right? So like that really populous colony that's building all those cells. So does anybody else want to unmute and just tell me what, what happens if I accidentally leave that frame in my cell builder too long and the queens start emerging? What's going to happen? Murder. They're going to kill murder. Her. Yes, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's going to be murderous, right? So uh, virgin queens are, I, I tell my students in my beekeeping class, they are queen killing machines. It's, it's like what they're designed to do. <laughs> they're like a heat seeking missile, right? They, they come out of their queen cell um, and the very first thing that they're doing is methodically walking the frames in that hive looking for any other queen cells so that they can seek out and kill those potential rival queens. So in other words, if you're not really timely about making sure that you have removed those queen cells and put them all in individual splits, um, you run the risk that like on this particular graft, rather than getting 45 queens out of it, you might only get one. Um, so very, very time sensitive, you know. 
and over the you know the last few years you know we're doing a dozen or more graphs a year and um, at any given time maybe grafting anywhere from like 50 to 100 cells so we've we've had just enough practice that we're kind of starting to like get it down to a fine art so um, we do a lot of staging of splits like we'll get all of our equipment out um, get splits actually like prepped and made up like the actual queenless splits are made up and in the hives and moved out into their yards and locations before the queen cells are ever ready, like like a day or so before they're ready. Um, so in essence, if I know that my queen cells are going to emerge on Sunday, then we are making our splits on, uh, well, we're, we're putting the cells into the splits on Saturday and I'm actually making the splits on Friday. So it's sort of like this big, uh, calendar, you know, that we're like orchestrating all the time to work with. Um, one thing that we have kind of done the last few years, and this has worked pretty well, so we just have like a very inexpensive um, incubator, like the kind of incubator that you would use to hatch chicken eggs or whatever. And so we'll take our queen cells when they're capped and take them out of that cell builder and actually bring them in the house and put them in the incubator for that last, um, I think it's like four or five day window or whatever while they're um, incubating before they're ready to hatch. So the nice thing about this is, is that um, it kind of gives me a better handle of like exactly how many cells I have to work with. So when I have to go out and prep and stage splits, you know, I know ahead of time, okay, I've got, you know, 95 cells or whatever the number is that, that we have to get ready for. Um, Okay, and I do have to just tell you this quick little story. This is the story of our biggest um, queen rearing debacle that we have had to date. This actually happened this last year um, in April. And we had, in fact, this might even be a picture of the cells that this happened with. We had 77 cells in our incubator and they were due to emerge, like, I don't remember the dates. Let's say they were due to emerge on Sunday. And so we were gonna go out and put them in the splits on Saturday. Well, Friday evening, we had been making splits all day, getting all of the hives ready and staging everything. We're completely exhausted and come in the house and somebody in the house noticed that there was a bee crawling around inside the incubator. So we lift the incubator lid and start looking um, and pulling out, pulling out some cells. And sure enough, um, our cells are looking kind of like the ones on the left in this picture. We had loose queens running around in our incubator. They had started hatching and emerging um, like a good 36 hours early on us. So it was just, to, to call it a fiasco is like a vast understatement. We were, we were trying to get cages. We were trying to cage queens as fast as we could. We were trying to, you know, get the whole incubator and get it out to our fields so that we could, you know, put those, the queens were in all stages of emergence at that point and just trying to get them into the splits um, before they all came out. So even, you know, in spite of like the craziness of the whole thing, we actually only lost one queen out of the 77. We, we lost one that died in a fight in the incubator. All the others um, we, we managed to keep, which we were pretty impressed with. Um, but the best part of the story I feel like is late that evening after we thought we'd gotten all the queens in the splits, we're back in the house and it's like almost time for bed, it's dark out. And I found one lone virgin queen crawling around on our kitchen counter like from back behind the toaster or whatever. Um, and I begged my husband to please take her out and put her in one of the, one of the splits. I knew we had a couple that were still queenless. Um, and so he did, cause you know, he, he's wonderful and <laughs> does what I ask. Um, but anyway, so I called her Scott's queen because he saved her. That, that's my husband, Scott. And amazingly enough, she did awesome. She got mated and this, this is legitimately a picture of her and um, some of her brood. And she was actually like one of our best queens this past year. She made a great honey crop. Um, I used her hive as a builder for some of our fall splits. And yeah, she's wintering great right now. So hopefully she'll, she'll do good. And who knows, we might graft off of her this spring. So along with like making so many splits all the time, uh, kind of goes without saying, we do sometimes have some equipment shortages. Um, much to my, my husband's chagrin, I'm often running like right at or slightly above capacity on my equipment at any given time. So 
Um, if you look closely at this picture, you'll see I don't actually have lids on these hives. These are just inner covers. And then I just put a piece of duct tape over the hole because we obviously were out of lids at that point. I tell people that I will, I will run bees in anything that holds frames. Uh, and sometimes even that is a, is a loose requirement. <laughs> So this is just a picture of us kind of going out and staging those splits and getting our nukes put in place um, the day before we're going to actually put cells in. One of the things that we've learned is that if we space those mating nukes out a little bit more, um, we tend to get a lot better return rate on those queens like getting mated and successfully getting back to the hives. Um, and I think a lot of that is just, um, you know, the geography, like they obviously they go on an orientation flight, so they should theoretically know which hive to come back to after they've been on their mating flight. Um, but having the hive spread out a little bit, it, it still definitely helps reduce, you know, the chances of them going in the wrong one. And then the other thing you might notice if you look carefully at this picture, so we've got the nukes set up on pallets and we're doing four to a pallet and each nuke is facing a different direction. So just having those entrances like facing different directions that we've also found that that makes a difference in terms of our, our return rate. And of course I can't give a presentation about queen rearing in Iowa without talking about our lovely Iowa weather. Um, this was the scene that greeted me this last year on April 15th when I woke up. And that was the day that I did have to go out and like actually shake these and make splits um, to prep for our first graft. Uh, and, and as I've already mentioned, like it's queen rearing, it's very time sensitive. You, you have to stick to the schedule because once you've grafted those queens, um, they're going to emerge on the date that they're due to emerge and they don't care that it has snowed. So you just have to have to tough it out and, and deal with it. And of course, you know, that it, that can be very challenging as well in terms of, um, you know, you want to be sensitive to be sure that you don't start your queen rearing too early in the year. Um, it does you no good to have, you know, a, a beautiful crop of queens if there's no sexually mature drones out there for them to mate with when they're ready to go on those mating flights. So very, very important that, um, you know, you're careful that you don't start too early uh, for that reason. So we have, you know, a handful of things that I that I select for when I'm looking around at my colonies each year and I'm trying to decide who's going to be a parent colony who or like who are going to be my breeder queens, the ones I'm going to graft off of. Um, we definitely select for, you know, like low mite counts, um, winter hardiness is kind of a given. Uh, honey production. I select really strongly for gentleness because I, I don't like cranky bees. I like to work my bees in a t-shirt and shorts in the summer. Excuse me. Um, and then I just sort of like, I'm kind of a sucker for gorgeous brood patterns like this. So I kind of unofficially select for um, hives that just really lay just amazing vast quantities of brood. I love a queen that will lay up frame after frame after frame like this. And so it's sort of this iterative process when we're selecting our colonies to graft off of. Um, we, we keep a certain number of what we've grafted every year. So let's say maybe like 100 colonies. And then of those 100, we might pick like the 10 best that we're going to do our next round of grafts off of. And then so on and so forth. So it's like we're always selecting from like the, the best ones to raise the next ones off of. And so what's been interesting to me just over, you know, five years of doing this is we're starting to see those traits that we select for are becoming much more pronounced. So, you know, like the, the brood thing, I don't think in the beginning, I don't think I was like consciously selecting for um, prolific queens. But what has happened is that, um, you know, we have hives that is just it's just brood for days. I mean, and, and it's, it's hard for me to know, I guess, comparatively speaking, like, is this average? Is this what most people are experiencing with, um, you know, their bees? I don't know. I know that when I have a colony that comes through winter, um, we pretty much expect that we're going to split that colony at least five or six times. Um, and I expect that every one of those is going to, um, should be a honey producer. So, and of course, along with having, you know, tons and tons of brood, 
you end up having tons and tons of swarms sometimes. It can be very challenging to manage. So, you know, this last spring was just like at a certain point, my husband and I kind of look at each other and it's like, have I overdone it <laughs> selecting for prolificness? Because um, you, at, at a certain point, you almost wonder if you've created a monster. So these are just some photos of, of literally these are swarms that um, all these photos are swarms we had last spring. Um, it's always a race, you know, to get those queen cells ready early enough to be able to make the splits before the hives themselves naturally want to swarm. So yeah, we actually, <laughs> last spring we had a little jo running joke where uh, like around two, three o'clock in the afternoon, we would call it swarm o'clock. And so we would go out and get in our um, like ATV, our four wheeler and just drive around the farm to just check and see if there was any bees hanging in any trees. Um, and almost every day <laughs> we found at least one. So definitely challenging. Um, continuous learning has definitely been important for me. Um, I tell people my favorite thing about keeping bees is that I, I know I'm never done learning. I know there's always something more to learn and I really enjoy that about beekeeping. So two summers ago in July of um, 2019, I signed up for Marla Spivak's um, short course in queen rearing up at the University of Minnesota. And that was fascinating. It's the, the class itself is really geared more towards somebody that has um, no queen rearing experience whatsoever. So, you know, if there's anybody out there that's listening, you think queen rearing is something that that might be an interest for you, this would definitely be a course that, you know, would be right up your alley. Um, a lot of the things they covered, like, you know, learning how to graft, I, I had already been doing it for a number of years. So I kind of, I knew a lot of that going in, but there were definitely lots of new things that, that I learned and picked up and, and took away from the class. This is me grafting in their um, lab up there. It was really cool just to see, you know, all the equipment and it's an amazing facility that they have. This was one of the really cool things. So when we did our test grafts and we were just testing maybe like six or 12, you know, transferring a half dozen or so larva, and then we could take them over to where they had a microscope set up that was connected to a TV screen and you could put it under there and actually look and see if the larva was still breathing and pulsating and moving. So would let you know if you had damaged that larva or not, if it was still alive after the grafting process. That was really cool. Um, this is just us manipulating the cell builders in their yard out there. That was probably my biggest takeaway. So. Um, they have a completely different method of putting together a cell builder up there than what I had previously been taught by my mentor, Dan. And so um, that was really, really interesting and something that we've started using um, in, our, in our beekeeping and, and cell builder, which has really helped. And then this was one other cool thing. So for anybody kind of familiar with like University of Minnesota, um, they've really hung their hat the last decade or so on developing a line of hygienic bees. And so um, Minnesota Hygienics, so the, the whole concept of hygienic behavior in a bee, what it means is that um, the bees can sort of sense underneath the capped brood if there's potentially something wrong with that larva. So maybe it's infested with varroa or maybe there's some other sort of like developmental problem, the larva has died or disease or whatever, they can sense that and basically they will uncap that brood and then remove the larva. So hygienic behavior is something, that, it's a trait that you can select for when you're um, you know, breeding queens. So they demonstrated for us how they do their hygienic tests and what they have here, this big device and the picture on the left is called a doer and it's full of um, liquid nitrogen. And so they would take this section of PVC and put it over um, a portion of cap brood on a frame and then they would fill it with liquid nitrogen to freeze and kill the brood underneath that round section. And so because the, the piece of PVC is, is a known size, they know exactly how many um, larvae are underneath there that are going to be killed. Um, and they have to let it sit there for like five or 10 minutes just for the, the tube to thaw out, like after all the, the nitrogen's evaporated so that they can 
pull the tube off there. Then they take that frame and they put it back in the hive. And they come back 24 hours later and pull the frame out and check to see how many of those um, larvae that had been frozen, how many of them have been removed by the hive. And so that's how they test um, for that hygienic trait. I thought that was pretty interesting. It's not something I select for in my bees and it's not something I've ever tested for, um, but it was really fascinating to see how they do that. So as far as my business um, and kind of where I'm at today and, and my goals, where I want to go, um, the picture on the left here is just kind of a lineup of, of nukes. So that's, we've kind of become a supplier of nukes. So as a queen rearer, we're, we're raising our own queens. Um, I get questions about whether or not I sell packages and, and my answer is always no, it, it wouldn't make sense for me to take a queen that's actively accepted and laying with her own bees to, to take her out of that situation only to cage her and put her in a package. Um, so for that reason, we're exclusively a nuke supplier. Um, and so I love that, you know, that the queen rearing is is really my cup of tea and, and selling the nukes is something that, that I wanna expand and do more of going forward. Um, uh, the picture on the right is uh, my husband and I just kind of handling and moving some of our honey crop this last year. And, you know, like any good beekeeper, I love honey, <laughs> but um, it's definitely something that we see more as a byproduct at this point of, of the queen rearing, um, as opposed to, you know, the bees being a byproduct of the honey production. So I, I would prefer to do more of the picture on the left and, and less of the picture on the right going forward. So part of that, um, you know, part of that for me means if I want to do less honey production but more queen rearing, it really means that I need to um, gear myself more toward running fewer hives in the summer. So I kind of do the opposite of what a lot of other beekeepers do. A lot of beekeepers want to run lots and lots of hives during production season in the summer. Um, and then come fall, you know, you're doing combines so that you have fewer to take through the winter. So we kind of do the exact opposite. We run as few as we can through the summer, through production season, because we really don't want to make a lot of honey. And then come, come early, or excuse me, late summer, early fall, like as soon as we pull our honey supers, then we're taking every hive and splitting it in half. So we take a hive that is um, in a double deep and it gets split so that every one hive becomes two. And this kind of accomplishes two things for us. So it allows me to boost my numbers up going into winter because I wanna have, um, ideally would like to have lots and lots of bees coming out of winter for that queen rearing um, and nuke sales. But then the other nice benefit is um, we get half of my hives then have really young, new, vigorous queens going into winter, which is nice. And then all those hives that have now been like reduced to a single deep, we go through the yard and every one of those gets a second story put on them. It's a full 10 frames that's all bare foundation. And so you might be wondering like, well, how do we get them to draw that out? Um, and I don't know, like if it's just kind of something unique in our area, we are very close to the Des Moines River Valley. So we have a lot of wetlands, um, kind of some unique forage in Iowa, I think just for like, in our location. But from about August 15th through the end of September, those bees, man, they draw out the, the 10 frames of air foundation. Like it's just crazy. So um, this, the frame that you see on the right here, this is an example of like one of those frames I'm talking about. And that's probably only been in the hive maybe 10 days, I would guess from the looks of it. That's how fast they, they draw those out. And then of course, you know, wintering in Iowa, that's something that has become very important to, to me. Um, we have definitely done the whole like sending bees to almonds. We've done that for a couple, did that for a couple years. Um, it was profitable. I wasn't, you know, wasn't necessarily a bad experience. It just, we've kind of ultimately decided it's not the route that we want to go um, with our business. So um, my goal is to produce really good quality queens, really good um, quality queens for Iowa and for our climate. And so I feel like an important piece of that is that we have to know that they winter well here in Iowa. So, you know, I know a lot of us, especially this week, it's so cold, a lot of us are cursing this, this winter weather. But um, for me, I really feel like um, Winter is, is really a blessing. I think we're really blessed to have these super cold temperatures because for me, it's the ultimate selector. 
uh, if I have a hive that doesn't make it through winter, then, you know, obviously that's not, that's not a queen that we want to graft off of next spring. So keeping them here in Iowa has um, definitely is, is good for our business. So that's pretty much our business in, um, in a nutshell. If you don't already follow us on Facebook, we would love that. Um, we try to post lots of fun and interesting things about, about our bees and about our business and what we're doing. And I'm going to stop my screen share here and we'd be happy to take some questions. Yeah, Ellen, fantastic presentation. Thank and you. so I, would, I was following the chat and got some questions. <laughs> And anybody else, please feel free to shoot some more questions this way, and I'll, I'll try to ask them. Um, so what do you do with your cell builder after you've raised the queens in it? So once you've gotten rid of the queens. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so the cell builder will, can get busted up and, and split into maybe like 12 different, different splits, as opposed okay. to your regular colony, which might just be five or six. The cell builder is so big, you can, you can make yeah. lots and lots of splits off of it. But actually we typically keep using our cell builder. So when I put one together, um, we might continue to do like graft after graft off in that, that builder before we bust it up late in the season. Okay, so there won't be any um, brood in that cell builder at all. Oh no, there's tons, of, there's tons of brood in the builder because you do have a queen in there. Um, yeah, there, there is a queen. So we use our builder. We kind of have some different ways of manipulating it so that we have a queenless starter and then queen right finisher, which is, I guess, a little outside the scope of this presentation. But, um, but yes, there is a queen in there. And so lots and lots of brood in, in those big colonies. Okay. And, uh, you know, to, to make it you know, like one question that I have is, do you have any, uh, like any books or any resources that you've like followed through this whole thing? Yeah. So um, when I was first getting started, my mentor, Dan, pointed me to Michael Palmer. Okay. And yeah. one of my favorite um, talks of his that you can find out there on YouTube is, uh, I think it's called Queen Rearing in the Sustainable Apiary. Yep. And I was super excited because he's actually going to be giving that same talk again here in like a week or so. I think he's speaking to an, a bee club, like maybe in Tennessee. I'm probably saying the wrong the wrong thing now, but you can find it on on Facebook. That event is coming up, so I'm definitely going to be tuning in and listening to that one. Excellent. Okay. Well, yeah, that's good. And that because, like you say, you know this this is just you know you kind of your quick presentation, and then it's nice to have something that you can follow right, outside right. of this. Yeah. Um, so what do you personally sell and where, where to get it? Okay. Um, so we are, as I said, we're exclusively a nuke supplier. I don't shake any packages. Um, we are selling nukes this year. I'm, I'm getting really close to the point where we're, we're probably going to shift over to a waiting list, but we are still taking deposits at this point. So if anybody's interested, feel free to, to email me or reach out on our Facebook page. I do try to keep queens throughout the year as well. So if you have a need for, you know, a queen for making splits, we would love to help you out with that. We do mark all of our queens. Um, we have the option of either buying her caged or you can buy her actively laying on a frame of her own brood and bees. That can be a really nice and easy way to introduce a queen and make acceptance a little bit better. Um, and then last but not least, I do also sell a limited number of queen cells every year. So if you're interested in trying making a split with a cell, that's kind of an inexpensive and fun way to, to try that out. Yeah. Yeah. And, and what, what, what do you sell that for? I know you've mentioned. Yeah. So the queen cells are $8 each. Okay. Yeah. Versus like the, the mated laying queen is 45. So. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. That is, that is fun. Um, very fun presentation, by the way. Uh, do, okay, do, um, so when you use um, oxalic acid, do you use vaporizer or do you ever use liquid? Yeah, we exclusively do the vaporization method. Okay. We do not do okay. dribble. Yeah. All right. Um, somebody asked, uh, how do you get kids not to be afraid of bees? Do your <laughs> kids do anything with your bees? 
I can hear my husband chuckling in the other room right now. Yep. Uh, when you guys figure it out, let me know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I would love to hear your techniques because my, my kids are fairly afraid. At least my oldest is really scared of bees. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's funny. I, it's bees are so fun to watch. Like on a screen. Yeah. Um, I really recommend to anybody, if you ever go to Lime Creek nature center in Mason city, they have an observation hive. Yeah. And that's an excellent way, excellent way to get kids kind of introduced to them. And you, like you mentioned, uh, seeing the queen and stuff. And every time I see a queen, yeah. I just, I'm like, wow, I just yeah. love, I love the way she looks and stuff. Yeah. So that's, that's awesome. Yeah. Um, okay. So when you prep your queen cups, do you use royal jelly? But like, do you prime them? Yeah, I don't. So, and that, I think that's just exclusively personal preference. So when you prime them with royal jelly, that's called wet grafting. If you don't do any priming, it's called dry grafting. Um, I've tried it both ways. It, I just like dry grafting, but I know a lot of people that swear by wet grafting and do that exclusively. So that's just something to play with and decide what your own personal preference is. Okay. Yeah, great. Um, so yeah, and we're getting a lot of questions, so I'll just kind of go through them a <laughs> little fast and stuff. Okay. And um, how often are you replacing your queens? Yeah, we've kind of gotten to a point now where I'm trying to keep new ones like every year. So pretty much once I've grafted off of my best, you know, best five or 10%, then they're all getting, you know, moved out. So if you're interested in a queen that was like a previous year's breeder queen, let me know because we do sell those every year. Okay. All right. Uh, so let's see. How many, like how many number of hives would you say you'd need to get started in queen rearing? Yeah, that's a great them? question. Um, I think probably a dozen would be a good number, at least to get started. I think if you had less, it'd be easier if you had 20. Um, yep. but, but I think you could do it with a dozen. Less than that, I think would be challenging to have enough resources to really get going. Okay. Yeah, great. Um, have you ever used the NICOT system? I have not, no. Okay. Um, are, you doing, are you doing this full-time or part-time? This like, is, is that, definitely do you have another full income? time for me. Well, <laughs> definitely yeah. full time. <laughs> it's funny. I try, I try to be careful. Like if somebody's new to beekeeping, I try to be careful and I try not to uh, sugarcoat it and say like, oh, you're going right. to have all the time in the world. It's like even having a couple of hives, like uh, I think you mentioned that, you know, like when there's something to do with my bees, I do it, whether, right. whether I have time to do it or not. And that's, I mean, that's the responsible thing to do. I know there's yeah, times where... That is definitely a big difference when you go from having just a few to having a lot of them. Suddenly your schedule is very much dictated by what their needs are. Yeah, definitely. All right. So what do you have a certain uh, uh, signal in the spring that it's time to start grafting? Primarily, I'm looking at, at drone development. That's, pr that's my main signal because that's really the most important thing is where you're at with drones. You'll hear people talk about looking for purple-eyed drones, um, which means just kind of uncapping that drone larva and checking to see what stage of um, development they're in, like that, not larva, but pupa, looking to see what stage of development the pupa are in. And if they're at the point where the pupa are starting to develop like coloration of the eyes, so the eyes are looking purple, then the, like theoretically the thinking goes they should be sexually mature by the time you would have a queen that's ready to to fly and and mate so we usually give it a little bit longer after seeing purple eyed drones but but yeah primarily just the the cues from the from the drone rearing yeah okay it's it's so fun because I'm, I'm taking a lot of questions and I'm, I'm listening to you but I'm learning a ton so thank oh, you good. for that um <laughs> So what type of queens do you sell? What, uh, what breed do you have? Yeah, that's probably the number one question that I have people ask me. I answer it all the time on my Facebook page. I keep thinking there's got to be a better way to <laughs> like get that information out there. Um, so because I'm raising all my own queens and because they're all open mated, I don't do any artificial insemination. I can't really claim that they're any one specific breed, you know, yeah. like we think of Italians or Carniolans or Russians or whatever. I they're not any of those. So for lack of a better, for lack of a better term, I just sort of call them an Iowa hybrid. 
Yeah. And I tell people the best thing I can do is just describe to you the traits that they exhibit, the things that I select for, and then you can compare that to the known traits of other breeds. So, yeah, I like they say that, you know, like if you uh, if you buy light colored or when they're selling like packages, if they're light colored, they're Italians, if they're dark colored, right. they're Carnivalians. So, yeah. <laughs> That's, that's true. And, and that's good. So did you start with Italians? Do you know? No, actually we started when we got started years ago, those first two packages, those were Carniolans. Okay. All so, right. And of course, just like everybody else, we catch swarms and you know, things like that. So I think yeah. the genetics are super mixed at this point. Okay. Um, so do you ship, uh, Queens around the country or do you only no. sell local? No, I don't do any shipping of bees. I'm, I'm sure that's something I probably could learn how to do. But I don't know. I feel like it's not great for the bees to be shipped. It's probably stressful on the queens. So we yeah. just do local pickup only. Yeah, I've gotten a package of like uh, 20 bees and it was so smashed. One queen uh -huh. was missing and there's yeah. a few that were dead and stuff. So yeah, yeah. I can only imagine what uh, UPS does <laughs> or like what they do with some of those packages. Yeah. Um, right. Hopefully it's not uh, Ace Ventura delivering your package. <laughs> Um, all right. So which, which grafting tool do you like best? Uh, just like the metal German grafting tool. That's again, something that's totally personal preference. I think you need to play around with different. Oh, you know what? Actually. Okay. I'm sorry. I say metal German grafting tool, but that's not true. I've kind of, since I took the Queen Marine course up at the University of Minnesota, we talked a lot about tools and played with different ones. And I've discovered, I actually do really like the Chinese grafting tool. Um, I've learned that if you buy a package of like a hundred of them, you have to really go through and look um, like that little, the reed where it touches the piece of wood, like they should actually be touching one another. And if you check your package of a hundred grafting tools, probably 20% of them will be bad and you can throw those out. So yeah, I used to not like those because I didn't realize I just apparently had a dud to begin with, but. Um, and then do you use a drone foundation to urge additional drone rearing? Not really, no. I have a few in my rotation, but no, it's it's not really something I do. Okay. And then uh, what equipment are you using for your mating nukes? Five frame, two frame, so because of our, yeah, because of our um, just constantly running whatever equipment, we were literally always out of equipment <laughs> at any given time. Um, so I'm using anything I have. We use a lot of five frame nukes. Sometimes I'm splitting into 10 frame deeps. Some We have a handful of queen castles, which are like a two frame, um, you know, setup. So I've got a handful of those in my rotation. We're, we're just like, begging, borrowing, and stealing to have enough equipment at any given moment. Yeah, and so you probably don't have uh, any problem with wax moth, I suppose, if you got all your equipment used. I mean, not really. Like, obviously, we're, with our honey super, you know, drawn comb, we, we store that to keep wax moths out in the winter, but yeah, no, other than that, every, everything's always in service. <laughs> yeah, well, that's good. I mean, some, i I have a lot that kind of can sit around sometimes and then yeah, yeah then I, I battle with those wax moths so much. Oh, sure. But, um yeah, so I think I uh I I think we have one more question and then and then we'll end it at that. Um how could you just explain quickly the the process of building a cell builder? Oh so, sure. Yep. So first of all, like there's a lot of different ways of making a cell builder. So what, what I'll describe is just the way that I do it, but it's just like making splits or anything else. You know, you ask 10 beekeepers, you'll get 12 different, you know, answers or methods. Um, but what we do is we take an extremely full, extremely populous colony that's in two deeps. And then we're basically going to add another 10 frames. So bring a third deep over. And we have a specific kind of layout for that hive. So we know that like our bottom deep, for example, we want that to be primarily honey and nectar. The second deep um, is going to be, I'm trying to remember here. I think the second deep is going to be uh, like capped brood and some open space. And then the top deep is primarily young larva. So when we're going and pulling the frames we need to, to 
put make that third deep up, we're basically pulling whatever specific things we need. Like we're taking an inventory of what's already in the hive and then just adding specifically what, what else we need. That's where I think it's handy to have lots of extra support hives so that you can walk around the yard and say, okay, I need three frames of cat brood. I need two frames of open larva. And you can actively look through other colonies to find specifically what you need. Yeah. All right. I, I got to ask, sorry, I got to ask one more question. Somebody yeah. brought it to my attention is, uh, so what do you use for mite control most of the, like different parts of the season? Yep. So because we're splitting both in the spring and in the fall, we're able to use that brood break method that I put up on the screen earlier, that Randy Oliver um, oxalic acid method. So that's kind of the primary thing. We do also go in and use a little bit of amitraz as well as needed because even the even the OA with the brood break, I, it seems like just is not and is not enough anymore. So it's yeah. a challenge for sure. Yeah, it's. And just to think about, too, that people didn't used to have to deal with that, like how I easy know, right? beekeeping would have been back, back then. Back in the good old days. <laughs> back in the good old days. So, yeah, Ellen, that's, yeah, we'll we'll end there. I know there's a, there's a few more questions coming in, but, um, yeah, great presentation. Thank you so much for all that information. Thank you for having me. Yeah, no problem. And then, uh, so 